We've seen photos and videos of UFOs. But now we may even have more tangible evidence that they're here. This thing you hear all the time that there is no evidence. There's tons of evidence. So there's a wave of UFOs over Pennsylvania and a strange residue reported coming down from one of the craft. It started opening up into a V and just dropped this metallic stuff. In Poland, there was a UFO sighting and supposedly some weird glowing rocks were left behind. The object is an aluminum alloy of unknown origin. And a metallic object reportedly ejected from a UFO. So am I seeing the soil itself begin to glow now? Could this trace evidence be proof that aliens are now monitoring planet Earth? This is something that I've been looking for all my life. This is definitely extraterrestrial. This is case number 85004, UFO relics. One of the most intriguing aspects of ufology tantalizing is the aspect of trace evidence. Trace evidence which forms the basis for most modern police investigations, for forensic lab work. Entire cases are broken on what trace evidence there is. We're going to apply that to ufology and to UFO cases. In most of the cases that we've investigated, most of the evidence has been of photos, videos, and like eyewitness testimonies. It's actually very rare to have something that you can analyze. Maybe we can get an understanding of what we're actually dealing with, what the UFO phenomenon is. Before I get too excited, I mean, I just want some confirmation here. Do we actually have something physical from somebody to, to analyze, or is this something somebody saw or an object that somebody heard about? We are actually on our way to meet a resident in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, who saw an object drop some kind of a flake-type residue, snowflake-type residue on a tree, and this was analyzed, and we are going to talk about the results of that chemical analysis of that material and see that analysis firsthand. So if we complete an analysis on an object, and the conclusion is, is that this object is extraterrestrial, and it's manufactured, I mean, that to me stands a test of science. That is the proof that I've been looking for this whole time. We're heading out to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where in 2008, the people in this area experienced a large surge in UFO sightings. Although many witnesses have seen these unidentified craft in the skies over the last year, we hear that in one case, the UFO actually left some clues behind that may prove something anomalous occurred. In ufology, we call this trace evidence. And although it's very rare, it could be the smoking gun evidence that we need to solve this huge mystery. I saw three different sightings of this craft. It was probably about 30 or 40 feet wide. It almost looked like you took a magnifying glass and put it over the sky and kind of moved it along. It was dead silent. You couldn't hear anything. It was there and then it disappeared right before my eyes. Eyewitness testimony about UFOs seen in Pennsylvania is eerily similar. But one witness we set out to meet in Bucks County offers a story a bit more intriguing. The UFO left trace evidence behind, a clue to the UFO's origin. I saw four craft in Bucks County. One of them spilled sparkle stuff down into my trees. My dog woke me up and he was growling. So when I came out, I just saw this bright light, you know, in the sky. I looked up and this big metallic silver object was there. So about how large would you say this object was? Probably like four of those tall trees. When it went onto its side, you could get a good view of the shape of it. 
It almost looked like it had a bumper that was shaped into a boomerang and the rest was just circular. It started opening up into a V and just dropped this beautiful metallic stuff into this tree and that tree. It looked like sparkles, like diamonds, and it was just flickering and it never stopped flickering. It was in the tree for about 20 minutes. I just was frozen. I just couldn't take my eyes off and I didn't want to go in the house to try to get a photograph because I was afraid of missing something. And I'm glad that I chose that because all of a sudden it just sucked back up like it was a vacuum and it went right back up into a V-shape again. Did you sense that it was a solid material? It looked like flakes or glitter that you would buy for a party and sprinkle around. Was it there the next morning? No, no, I didn't see anything after that, no. If this craft ejected or sprayed something onto Denise's tree, you would think that it would leave some physical evidence behind. So that's what we're looking for. So eventually you contacted MUFON with right. this. And what exactly did they do when they showed up? Um, they took pictures, took my story, and they were taking samples of my tree. And Did they find anything? Yeah, they said they did. Now, our next step in this investigation is to talk to our friends from Pennsylvania MUFON, John Vetri and Bob Gardner, and see exactly what they found and get their analysis of that material. Can you tell me what you guys did when you got the call, how you investigated this case? We have very specific procedures on how to collect evidence in the chain of custody. We stick to that chain of custody very tightly. So you're treating each, each uh, case like, like a crime scene? Exactly. So how long did it take after Denise's report before you guys came down to take the samples? I took the sample maybe about like a week after it came down. An entire week elapsed before Bob was able to get to the scene and search for trace evidence. And this might not sound like a long time, but when searching for clues at a crime scene, like these guys treat every one of their cases, it's an eternity. But any evidence that could possibly have been left there could be contaminated or gone altogether. But hopefully they got lucky. There were two trees that were actually affected. This privet tree here and then a the maple tree back there. I uh, took samples from the affected trees, took soil samples from the affected area, and then I walked down about 100 yards, there's another maple tree down there. So I took a sample from there, and then the closest thing I could find to this privet was around the corner. So I took a sample of that along with the soil, bagged it up, and then sent it out to uh, labs to be tested. What about equipment? Do you guys have any special equipment, uh, detectors, that sort of thing? I have a Geiger counter, which for example, when I came out, I put the Geiger counter over the leaves, it went off. And when I reached into the tree, closer to the, the, the branches, it didn't go off. It went off on the outer part of the leaves where, where it was affected. And he even tested other trees around and got nothing. Bob conducted his investigation just like a CSI. An important step is to collect control samples from the trees and the dirt in the surrounding area. These samples are then used by scientists to read what is normal in the environment. They're then compared to samples that are collected from ground zero of the event to determine if anything anomalous has occurred. Like Bob said, he took samples from all around. But on this tree in particular, the leaves had like a little phosphorescent burn marks on them. We have boron and magnesium on the leaves. So would you say, in your opinion, after the analysis, that at least this, and maybe the two of them, they were anomalous in their readings? Absolutely, yeah. because yeah. Denise said she saw it happen at this tree and that tree. And plus, it's not in the soil either. Normally what's in the soil is in the tree. Bob took soil samples, and the boron, the magnesium, it was not in the soil. So something had to land on this tree. We normally get about eight UFO sightings a month. What happened in this case, we had 225 sightings in the second half of the year. We went from eight to a high of 63 in July, and we were averaging 45 uh, sightings a month. This area had half of all the UFO sightings last year. Could it be that the craft that dispersed an unknown substance over Denise Murder's tree matches the same craft that was seen by other witnesses in the area, but on different occasions. 
although we have yet to find any other witnesses to talk about sparkles coming down from the craft, we decided to pull together three of the key UFO eyewitnesses in the area. And we enlisted the help of sketch artist, Detective Sergeant Ivan Mendez of the Trenton Police Department to help us draw a composite sketch of what these witnesses might have seen. I would say it's like an aspirin shape. The sides were bubbled out. There was three glass bulbs on the bottom of the craft. And then it had small windows around the, the side of it. They were glowing. Beautiful colors kind of like spinning around, looked like windows. Do you mean you think that the light was coming from inside the craft? That's what I was guessing by the look that I had. And it was kind of shaped like this, like a hang glider is the way I would describe it. And it was flying this way, like that. Oh, that's good. That's excellent. Um, it's kind of like a ball, like a circular, but it was very like edgy, like it kind of had a lot of angles. If you had to compare this to an object, what would you compare it to? Probably more like a stop sign. Stop sign. But it had like plates on the side of it. It had more angles than that. So it was a sphere, yeah, but a multifaceted, a lot more sides on, on, on this thing. Yeah, exactly. Take a look at this and just see how close this is to what you saw. I, I think that's pretty accurate on the way I saw it. It's looking pretty real, like the way I saw it. After meeting with the witnesses and after seeing Sergeant Mendez's sketches, we made a discovery that I believe validates Denise Murder's experience. I mean, it's quite obvious based on the pictures. Everything's consistent with each other. At first, it looked like it would be a plane, but I could tell at nighttime when I saw it that all these lights, they don't match up to what a plane would look like. We've enlisted the help of police sketch artist, Sergeant Ivan Mendez, to see if eyewitnesses here in Pennsylvania are seeing the same or similar craft. The sketches are mind-boggling, and I feel that the sketches shown to us authenticate Denise Murder's sighting, and quite possibly, the UFO trace evidence itself. I mean, it's quite obvious based on the pictures. Uh, everything has a aspirin-like circular shape. They yeah, definitely all have some similarity with respect to the lighting. Everything's consistent with each other. Well, what's really interesting about this description is it looks so similar to uh, Denise's description. Exactly. You've got lights around the edge primarily and then lights on the bottom. Denise says there were, there were three lights. Um, it was Caitlin who says there are multiple lights at the bottom, but I don't know, maybe this is just a recollection. Would it be safe to conclude that these might actually be the same craft? Oh, absolutely. Witnesses see things differently, especially during the course of excitement or le the level of stress they are experiencing at the time. So being the fact that we actually put these together side by side, I mean, they have a lot of characteristics in common, so I will have to say yes. According to Sergeant Mendez's professional opinion, all of our witnesses in Bucks County saw the same thing. The question in front of us now is, why are they here? Are they testing our trees? Are they testing our people as well? We have to find out what they're testing. We're gonna meet with Nancy Talbot of BLT Research, who's investigated countless other trace evidence cases. She packaged the research on this whole Bucks County investigation. Well, Nancy, we're investigating some of the best UFO trace cases that we can. And we're wondering, what are some of the best cases you've come up with? Several years ago, I went to Poland. We discovered the Golovki rock case which produced some magnificent evidence. Nancy embarked on a research trip to Poland to investigate multiple trace evidence cases. She visited the small town of Golobki where she investigated a UFO encounter that occurred on a small farm in a very rural area. There's a young man there, his name is Miłosz, and he was 11 or 12 at the time this had happened. It was 1998, I believe. And they live in this tiny little town of Golopki. There are only maybe five or six farms in the village. And one night, his mother, Evelina Kuss, was awakened in the middle of the night by an orange-red glow coming through her windows. She got up, went to the windows, and then observed 
a disc-shaped, brilliant, fiery, orangey-red object very slowly coming down into this field. As she watched, this thing to slowly settle down into that field. And after a while, the glow died out. It wasn't very long before the whole family got up. Miwos decided to go down to the spot in the field where she had seen this thing. He found a bunch of stones in a more or less elliptical arrangement down at the very end of that field that had never been there before. Was the location of the sighting of the unidentified flying object, did that correlate to the location of the ring of stones that was, that was found in the field? According to Evelina, precisely. It's an interesting connection that this mysterious ring of stones were found exactly where the UFO was witnessed. Uh, I'm eager to find out what these stones really are and why were they even placed there. So he tried to pick them up and they were too heavy. He was only 11 at the time. In the center though, there was one smaller one and that picture on the top is the one smaller one that he could lift. They were very dense. Okay, so these rocks, they were actually sitting on top of the ground. They were apparently deposited. It is bizarre, but the evidence points to these stones just being dropped on a farm in Poland. Although there is no obvious way to explain this, Nancy told us of some other cases that occurred nearby the farm that may offer another explanation. While I was there, I also investigated a number of very strange holes in a nearby village. A neighbor had witnessed one evening a brilliant triangle up over the trees, very close to the house. It hovered for a while over that field, and her grandson found this huge hole in the snow with no dirt on the snow at all. And all the fill was taken out? And there was none of it deposited on the snow. There were several other cases of that same sort of thing documented in the time period just before Evelina Kuss had her sighting. We wonder, are these craft actually using soil to test and deposit elsewhere? Is it like Denise Murder's tree where somehow some particles rained down on it and then were vacuumed up again by some beam? Wherever these craft come from, they're not just looking at us. They're testing our leaves and grass and ground. They're testing our soil. And they're testing us. Samples from Denise Murder's tree and pieces of the rock from Golobki, Poland, were sent to Frontier Labs in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Phyllis Spunger, along with Nick Ryder, have analyzed these samples, and we hope they can provide us with some answers. So what was the first analysis that you did with the samples that you got from MUFON? I reviewed them with a fluorescent light to see if I could find any visible particles. Was there anything actually stuck to the leaves that looked unusual? Was there? Uh, I did find on the affected tree leaves uh, a couple of specks that actually fluoresced green under a long wave UV handheld lamp. So those piqued my interest and uh, took a look at them with a scanning electron microscope and energy dispersive spectroscopy. A scanning electron microscope, or SEM, is a type of electron microscope that images a sample's surface by scanning it with a high energy beam of electrons. The electrons then interact with the atoms that make up the sample, or in this case, the UFO trace evidence, which then provides the analyst with important information regarding the sample's composition and chemical makeup. As you can see here in this photo, they look like eggshells. Now, of course, this whole flight that these were part of was only maybe the size of a head of a pin. So Nick, have you found this substance in any other cases? There have been a number of cases off and on over the years in UFO residue of very small microscopic spherical particles. The leaves, at least, appeared to have roughly twice the boron content than the control leaves did. Is it possible that like, the landlord of the premises saw that this tree wasn't doing well and sprayed some pesticides it's, on it? It is certainly possible. Boron is a key element in many pesticides, so it's entirely plausible that the reason for these increased levels of boron is due to the landlord or the gardener simply spraying an infested tree. 
What is the evidence that we have here that is absolutely anomalous? It sounds to me like it might be these fluorescent particles. The explanation was something natural. And I says, oh my goodness, I recognize that. And I matched it up with a reference in my files. And I said, it's uric acid. I said, that's the primary component of bird urine. So maybe the findings are a bit humorous. The analysis shows that Nick and Phyllis's work, it's been meticulous. And you can't blame them because all they found was bird pee. You have trace evidence because, quite frankly, all the real trace evidence, the evidence of the UFO, that could have been washed away long ago. That doesn't mean the end of this case. It only means that the trace evidence might have been there, but now it's gone. So in addition to this Bucks County case, both of you also analyzed the material from the Golovki case in Poland. What did you find in that case? Well, we basically found that there was vitrified glass-like soil. It looked like it was dirt in a glassy form. Soil vitrification occurs when soil is heated to 1,500 to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Although vitrification can occur naturally, let's say with a lightning strike, the unnatural process of soil vitrification is being used to clean up toxic waste sites. The process includes putting four electrodes into the infected area of the toxic spill. An electric current is then passed through the electrodes to create heat, thus melting the surrounding soil. The result, a glass-like rock that contains the harmful contaminants, making it safe for transportation. It's an expensive process and fairly new technology that is only now beginning to be utilized. Is it likely that this is the explanation for the soil vitrification in Golubki, Poland? Probably not. So there was no evidence of someone performing this vitrification there? That, no, that was my understanding. Okay. No. So which leaves us with uh, the possibility that it was either trucked in or that there is some connection with the, the UFO that was sighted the night before. One other explanation is that hoaxers created this vitrified soil and placed it in the backyard of the Kuss family farm. Why? Who knows? But we have to entertain this possibility. So they found vitrified soil the size of cinder blocks. That's a pretty big size. What kind of equipment do you think it would take for a human being to make something like that? You'd probably have to resort to a really large hydrogen torch, but all of those things require industrial-sized commitment. You could not make these in your barn. Vitrification of soil is expensive, and it's difficult. However, it is possible. But is it with tools normally found on a farm? We've arranged a vitrification test to determine if using an arc welder and an oxyacetylene torch can produce enough heat to create vitrified soil. We're in Levittown, Pennsylvania, meeting Cindy Fidjelkowski, owner of First Choice Welding, to see if we can fuse soil together uh, using common welding equipment. We have um, two different processes that can definitely surpass 3,000 degrees. The oxygen acetylene torch uses the two gases combined to produce temperatures around 6,000 degrees. The other process that we can use is called stick welding. What that uses is an electrical current that goes from the welding rod into the workpiece. Temperatures can go up to 10 to 12,000 degrees. So speaking from the perspective of a rural farm in Poland, you'd need a real power supply, a real heavy duty power supply for that second uh, process you're talking about. Yes. Well, have you ever tried anything like this before? No, I have not. Do you think we'll have any success? I'll give it a whirl. Let's go. We've come to First Choice Welding to meet with Cindy Vigilkowski. We've set up a vitrification test to determine if common tools found on a farm or an industrial environment can produce enough heat to create vitrified soil. We know that during a UFO sighting in Golubki, Poland, vitrified soil was either dropped or intentionally placed on a farm, but we don't know why. Entertaining the theory that this could be a hoax, we want to see what somebody would have to go through to create these chunks of vitrified soil. All right, I'm, I'm happy with the way the soil is set up. I, I did look into uh, uh, the Socorro, New Mexico case, which involved uh, uh, Lonnie Zamora's sighting of a, of a craft that landed in the desert and caused a glassification or vitrification to occur in the desert. We actually uh, visited a local artisan who used a type of uh, oven for melting glass. He told me that it's actually very difficult to melt sand uh, using welding equipment. So I'll be very interested to see if we can actually do that today. 
So the first thing I'd like to do is start with the arc welder. We're first going to see if an arc welder can produce a vitrified piece of soil. The process is relatively simple. We laid a piece of metal on top of the dirt and welded it to the surrounding box that we built to contain the soil. This container is now grounded to the earth, allowing the current to flow and the weld to take place. The hottest point on the metal is going to be the exact point where the welding rod meets the metal. Mm -hmm. And then as, as we weld, the heat's going to flow with the weld and it is going to disperse. However, it is going to lose about 50% of its heat process. Well, there seems to be some charring there. Well, is it possible that some vitrification occurred on like a granular level? Like really Maybe very tight, minute. But certainly mm. not on the scale that no. we're talking about in Poland. No. Huge Absolutely cinder not. blocks of vitrified no. substance. We attempted to vitrify soil using an arc welding process and we had no success. And to tell you the truth, I didn't expect that we would. The heat dissipated into the environment and it wasn't concentrated enough to vitrify the soil. So next we're going to attempt to vitrify the soil using an oxyacetylene torch, and I expect to have more success with this because we have a high temperature flame in direct contact with the soil. And we're talking about a maximum of 6,000 degrees of heat, which is well beyond the limits of, of what is needed. And we're going to apply this heat for about a minute, maybe two. It looks like we're having some kind of reaction there, to tell you the truth already. I'm not sure of the vitrification, but you can see the soil glowing. Right now, the flame from the oxyacetylene torch is melting and therefore fusing the different elements inside. I think it's obvious that this is working, but how much vitrified soil are we actually going to be able to create is the question. So am I seeing the soil itself begin to glow now? But look at how much work it's taken just to melt that little coin-sized bit of dirt, though. All right, I think that's good enough for now. Okay, so we have a little crater. Well, it's obvious from the results of the oxyacetylene test that you can vitrify soil using high heat, using metal working tools that are found on a farm. But it was just such a small amount, of, of, a very thin layer, and we would not be able to make a, a anything comparable to the size of what was found in Poland. What are the chances of some kid in Poland being able to do this with, with welding equipment? Well, maybe if we took maybe about 15 of them, put them together and did it. Impossible on a farm. This was really fascinating. Well, I think it's interesting when you think about how much energy was generated just to create that little tiny chunk. I think it's safe to say that these giant vitrified chunks weren't created with normal farming equipment. That's for sure. Well, there's one thing that we really need to remember is that soil vitrification didn't happen at the same place where the UFO sighting was. Now, I can't, I'm not saying that a UFO didn't create it, but it didn't vitrify there. Now, you know, Nancy was talking about these mysterious holes that she was investigating in Poland as well. Uh, put two and two together, maybe these UFOs are analyzing our soil the same way we think the sparkles are analyzing Denise Murder's tree. Well, think about it for a second. If there are extraterrestrials traveling halfway across the universe to the planet Earth, they have superior technology in so mm. many ways. Do they really need to analyze a tree in Nancy's backyard and some soil in a farm in Poland? Well, I mean, why not? I mean, what would you know about an advanced civilization, right? We don't know what they're up to. You're both right in your own way. Um, I think we could debate this the entire day, okay? Here's something that I think will really fascinate you. We're gonna talk to Bob White. Bob White says, that he saw a UFO, it saw him, it shot something to Earth. He picked it up and he says it's a piece of a UFO. If this is the real thing, I want to see it.
when it went up into the sky, it was something I had never seen before. And I had the feeling it was not of this world. Hi, good morning. Hi, Bob, how are you? Although we've looked at other UFO trace evidence cases, Bob's is different. He says he has an actual piece of a UFO that he discovered after an amazing encounter in 1985. Bob, could you tell us how you came into possession sure. of this unique looking object? I was in Grand Junction, Colorado, between uh, Grand Junction and Cisco, Utah, and it was late at night, and uh, the lady friend and I were driving. We saw this light up ahead. This was a huge light. It was about the size of a three-story building. But she turned the headlights on me, and when she did, this thing just shot up in the air like that, just as fast as my eyes could follow it. And it connected to two other lights, like two blue neon tubular lights, one on top of the other, with a space in between. And when it hit this, it just shot out of sight. But before it did, I saw kind of a little explosion light. This thing came back down toward me. There was a groove in the ground, and I followed the groove in the ground until I saw this thing lying there, and it was still glowing hot. So after Bob sees this object, he heads out to where he thought the piece had landed, and he sees this groove in the ground, as if this piece came down at a high velocity and skidded to a stop. Now this is the first time I've heard a story like this, and the fact that he not only found this piece, but has it to show, is amazing. So Dr. Gibbons, have you done any work yourself on this? Yes, I have. Dr. Robert Gibbons is a physicist who's formerly worked at NASA, Northrop Grumman, and Hughes Aircraft. He served in the U.S. Army for over 20 years, and his entire experience, he's never encountered anything quite like the Bob White object. In the year 2000, he joined Bob White's team to determine once and for all what this object really is. So we went to Laughlin, Nevada, and during that time, the object affected the batteries in the wall safe at the hotel three days in a row. The batteries had died and were broken open the first day. People from the hotel had to come up and put on electronic meter to open the safe. The meter said the safe is open, yet it was not. So the first night they had to drill it. This happened two more nights in a row. There must be some effect coming from the object, some kind of radiation or something causing those batteries to go dead. Whatever caused this safe to malfunction, it was obviously not an isolated incident. So to determine if it was some kind of x-ray or gamma ray, Dr. Gibbons set up a test utilizing dental x-ray film and the Bob White object. I made a cylinder. We put a, a film, unexposed film at the top, unexposed film at the bottom, and then we had uh, facing in on the cylinder films. And we came up with a really, really interesting conclusion. These are the actual dental x-ray films. The one of importance is the one with the two black spots. Right, so you're saying you held the object up to x-ray. Actually, actually, this sat on the film for 48 hours. And during that time, something exposed the film, not just fogged it, but put two distinct spots which match up with the two lobes, if you will, of the object. It looks like the object has two distinct lobes, as Dr. Gibbons calls them. And in this x-ray test, when you line up the film with the object, the two lobes match up almost perfectly with the exposure on the film. So something is emitting from the object that causes the film to expose. But what this is and the reason for this, it's still undetermined. Well, what about scientists? What, what have they said about this? The first thing I did was send it to New Mexico Tech and Dr. And he said, had I known the story on this, I would have suggested that you do isotope ratio abundance tests on it because he said, we don't have the equipment here to, to perform these tests. An isotopic ratio abundance test measures the amount of isotopes in a given element. Different elements like chromium, titanium, and strontium have a range of isotopes in their composition. But formed in a different or even alien environment, these ratios could be different. I had uh, contacts to go to uh, Los Alamos, and there I met uh, uh, 
uh, who was the uh, top uh, metallurgist, and Dr. who they called in on special occasions. And he was really excited about this because he had never seen anything like it before. He said to me, uh, this is something that I've been looking for all my life. He said, this is definitely extraterrestrial. Now we have a report from Los Alamos. They said they did the analysis on silicon. I called Dr. and I asked him about it. He said, aluminum, aluminum. And I'm saying, why does he keep telling, why does he keep talking about aluminum? The report says you did it in uh, on silicon. He said, well, we'll have to talk to did it. So I called and said, isotopes? No, we didn't do any isotopes tests at all. Although Los Alamos was supposed to do this isotopic ratio abundance test, they denied that they did. So were you getting the feeling that all these scientists that were doing the analysis were, were lying to you? Absolutely lying to me. We have a piece that may have fallen off of a UFO. We know that it affected a wall safe and caused it to malfunction three nights in a row. And although there have been multiple labs and analysts that have looked at this object, Bob claims that they're scared to talk about it after their tests. But we've contacted two scientists who are brave enough to talk to us and analyze the Bob White object. My initial impression of the object was that it was extremely extraordinary. Um, it was something like which I'd never seen before. Chris Ellis is a solid state physicist with an expertise focusing on aluminum alloys and semiconductors. After pouring over the data, we found that the object is an aluminum alloy of unknown origin. This is not anything like we've seen before. There are some very unusual uh, metals in this object that you typically do not find in other alloys. What's the chance that these elements would end up in this alloy either naturally or accidentally? I'd have to say pretty much zero. So this is absolutely a, a manufactured object. Looking at a detailed list of all the metals and all the um, elements that can be found in this object, it's conclusive that they're there by purpose. This looks like a manufactured piece created by some form of intelligence. Now, could it be made by us or could it have been made by an extraterrestrial? We're looking at something much more advanced than what we're currently familiar with today. We are in Kimberling City, Missouri, investigating the Bob White story. In 1985, after seeing multiple UFOs, an object is either ejected or shot down towards the ground. Through scrupulous scientific analysis, no one can say what this piece actually is. We are now sitting down with two scientists who are brave enough to come out and speak to us. And even though the institutions they're affiliated with requested to remain anonymous, we are uncovering new clues that are being discovered about Bob White's object. I did two types of tests. The first test I did was an X-ray diffraction analysis. David Lamb is a research scientist currently at a major university in the U.S. His expertise is in physics and material science, and he spent the past year researching the Bob White object. What's very unique about this is we have what's called an amorphous peak here. And that amorphous peak tells me that this is a polycrystalline semiconductor. What's the significance of that? I mean, how, how anomalous is that? You don't find that in aircraft aluminum. Where do you find it? I'm not aware you find it anywhere. Another thing that's very unusual in this is it has silver in it, and a very high percentage of silver, um, about 4.3% silver. Silver is only used in aluminum at the experimental stage of superconductivity. If you spray the surface of aluminum with silver, then you enhance superconductivity. Superconductivity is a phenomenon in some metals that occurs at very low temperatures, resulting in absolutely zero electrical resistance and excludes the interior magnetic field. This means that an electric current introduced to the superconductor can flow and persist freely and indefinitely without any added power source. Let's say you fire a, a, a bullet through a magnetic field, well, it's gonna have experienced drag. But what if that bullet was able to superconduct it? It would expel the magnetic field and that bullet would not slow down. It would not experience any kind of drag. So, if this was something traveling through space and it was going through, let's say, 
Jupiter's powerful magnetic field, it's, it could theoretically expel that magnetic field and zip past Jupiter without experiencing those forces. Now with superconductivity, is that difficult to achieve? Space is the perfect environment for superconductivity. You have to expend no energy to get objects to be superconductive in space. So if an object were fabricated to travel in space on its own, this would be the kind of object it would be? Yes. You're going to get the biggest bang for your buck out of the native properties of this object in space. It's a perfect fit. Let's put the pieces together. Bob White's object reminds me of other cases we've investigated in the past. Maury Island, where a witness said metal objects were ejected from a UFO. I took a little sample from the serrated edge of this aluminum piece. Most of the material you can identify. You know, it's the question of whether it's anomalous or whether it's normal. Aurora, Texas, where Brawley Oates gave us an unknown aluminum alloy discovered at a mysterious crash site. Right away, we could tell this was aluminum. Uh, that's the highest peak. So what's that one, that larger peak? Could we have uh, picked up contaminants from the soil? Even if we did, it should correspond to some element that we could match here. That's interesting. Maybe we discovered a brand new element. What do all these things have in common? These objects have unique qualities that might point to an extraterrestrial origin. So we've had three trace evidence cases that we've looked at, and each time I get excited that we're going to come up with some kind of evidence that proves what we're dealing with is not of this Earth. But every time, I'm disappointed. I think the evidence is absolutely overwhelming, going all the way back to the 1930s, running right through for 70 years. There's a collection of trace evidence that is astounding. The problem is it's absolutely proving without a shadow of a doubt that that trace evidence is causally connected to the high strangeness that people experience. I think the wall between what we have now and where we want to be for absolute proof is tissue paper thin. We must keep going. The answer is on the other side of that wall. We've investigated Bucks County and heard amazing testimony. And we corroborated the stories of eyewitnesses to an amazing craft. Although we had no idea what to think of these sparkles that Denise Murder described, I think we've shown with a preponderance of evidence what these UFOs are up to. After hearing the cases in Poland of this vitrified soil possibly connected to these unidentified holes, we think they might be testing us. But for what reason, we don't know. Then we hear the story of Bob White and actually hold the object in our hands and we read the reports from top-level institutions that can't identify it. It's fantastic. And as time passes, further scientific testing may one day prove that it's of extraterrestrial origin. I'm not alone in thinking that trace evidence may be the key to discovering what's behind these UFOs. It's just a matter of time before we discover that smoking gun that will blow this secret wide open. Let's go. We just received a phone call from David Lamb. After conducting additional scientific testing, he now theorizes that Bob White's object is a quasi-crystal of a very complex structure. This type of structure is considered to be the cutting edge of nanotechnology. It didn't exist in 1985, and even today, it's in its early stages of development. I believe, as science and technology progress, it will one day be possible to properly identify the nature of Bob White's object and prove once and for all it's extraterrestrial. It's Area 51, but underwater. And it could be hiding a big secret. We had a radar contact pop up that appeared to be a landmass where no landmass should exist. Are these USOs extraterrestrial? Or are they advanced craft reverse engineered by the US Navy? Did you feel that was something you were not supposed to see? Absolutely. I don't think we're really welcome here, guys. 
For the first time ever, former employees of this top secret base break their silence. I've seen an entity twice, but definitely it's alive. Our investigation takes us to the edge of the Bermuda Triangle and possible proof of an alien civilization. Right there, we're over something. We're over something, Mike. This is case number 59106, Underwater Area 51. We're in the Bahamas now, investigating a UFO connection around a real American military installation called AUTEC. AUTEC stands for the Atlantic Undersea Test and Evaluation Center. It was opened in 1967. It's on Andros Island, a remote location in the Bahamas. It sits on what's called the Tongue of the Ocean. This is a deep ocean basin that's roughly 110 nautical miles long, 20 nautical miles wide, and reaches depths of 6,000 feet. It's a perfect spot for testing new top secret weapons, submarines, and other exotic underwater craft. Is it a coincidence that ever since Autech was constructed, UFO and USO reports in the area have skyrocketed? And it's even stranger that Autech happens to be located on the cusp of the Bermuda Triangle. We're going to Autech, the Atlantic Undersea Testing and Evaluation Center. This is the Navy's Area 51. A lot of people haven't even heard of Autech. It's so top secret. And uh, we're lucky we're actually going to be able to talk to a few former Autech employees who are coming forward for the first time with their own USO sightings. From what we know, Autech has three test ranges. They carry out integrated three-dimensional aerospace and hydrospace trajectory measurements of weapons, acoustic, and sonar technology. They even set up an electronic warfare threat simulator, essentially a place to conduct undersea war games. Well, you know, I don't see Autech as being quite the secret that Area 51 is. I mean, after all, they have a website. Now, maybe this is one of those right before your very eyes type of deals. Underneath it all is something very, very secret. And I've always wondered, since this is near the Bermuda Triangle and since there is so much USO and UFO activity, is there a relationship between USO and UFO activity and Autech, this center on the edge of the Bermuda Triangle? My name is Kurt Rowlett. I'm a former Autech employee. On one evening, we pulled out of the dock here. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we had a radar contact pop up directly in front of our ship that appeared to be a landmass where no landmass should exist. Kurt Rowlett was an employee of Autech back in 1985. But years before that, in 1980, he was in the Coast Guard where he worked in the vicinity of Autech, and he witnessed what he now describes as a gigantic USO coming out of the water. Well, could you tell us about this night that you uh, encountered this object? Back to my Coast Guard days, we pulled away from the Autech dock. It was well after nightfall, and I'm at the helm watch, and suddenly the officer of the watch tells me, hey, I've got a radar contact showing land dead ahead about three miles. That's something that's patently impossible because we're in the tongue of the ocean and it's a thousand fathoms deep. Is it possible this could have been something related to the military? I don't think so. This is more along the lines of the size of an island. Now landmass three miles wide is huge. So to put this into perspective, the island of Manhattan at its widest point is 2.3 miles. So we're talking about a landmass wider than Manhattan. Subsequently, at the same time, the compass began to swing wildly, completely out of control. Couldn't believe my eyes. You know, what am I, what am I looking at? What's happening? Am I in any sort of danger? 
So the compass was going wild. It was going wild when it shouldn't be because wow. it's a calibrated compass and it's steadfast, you know. And was anything seen with, with eyes and binoculars? Not a thing. No visual contact? Not a thing, but it was certainly entered into the ship's log as a, a legitimate incident that happened on board. And that's something that doesn't go into the log unless the captain takes it seriously. We've heard this sort of thing before. We talked with uh, Ray Bowyer, who saw two giant objects over the English Channel. We were at 4,000 feet. I could see the objects. The roughly how big? Do you have any idea? No, I'd say at least a mile across. We talked with Charles uh, Dubac, uh, the French pilot who saw uh, a huge uh, disc over Paris. The dimension was huge, absolutely huge. We're getting a more complete picture with this uh, count of Kurt Rowlett that these objects can not only be in the skies, but may also be able to uh, descend into the water and, and surface and, and be caught on radar. So how long was this landmass there? Well, it stayed on the screen for about three minutes. And at that point, it started to actually literally dissolve off of the radar screen. At the exact same time, I get the compass back. Would you identify it as an unidentified submerged object coming up and then dropping again? That would make the most sense because a radar only picks up objects that are actually on the surface of the sea. Essentially, it would have to have been below the ocean, above sea level, and then dropping below sea level again. And this was right here at the tongue of the ocean? About halfway between the Altec base and the north end of the island here. Kurt Rowlett tells a great story, and he's a very credible witness, but this could possibly be explained by a radar malfunction, a top secret submarine that the Navy was testing, or even an experiment with a massive false radar target. How rare is an event like this? I would say pretty darn rare. An object one to three miles wide in an area as restricted as Autech, it means Autech had to know about it. Perhaps it was a craft from Autech itself, or perhaps it was from somewhere else. The fact is he's not the first Ortec employee to witness an unexplainable craft in the tongue of the ocean. I was standing on the ramp of a torpedo retriever boat, and that's when I saw the object rise up from the depths. I really didn't know what to think of it, and it could be something uh, not from this world. We're about to meet David Malcolm, a former Ortec employee who had a really eerie and strange experience one day when he was sent out to pick up torpedoes, but found himself staring at something else. My job title was a weapons technician, and our job was to go out, collect the torpedoes and missiles after they were fired, and recover them, bring them back into the, the base. One particular day, probably the winter of 72 to 73, we were uh, in the middle of a test and recovering of uh, one of the torpedoes, and I saw a submerged object that rose out of the depth and came into my field of vision. And just as quickly as it rose, it seemed to just vanish. Can you describe it for us? Uh, the best description I could give you would be uh, cylinders, a collection of pipes. I really should say, I, I didn't get a clear sense of the length of this thing. I actually don't believe I saw either end of this. You have a limited visibility in the water. So this could have been huge. It could have been huge. This could very well be the same craft that Kurt Rowlett saw on his radar screen, which he said was one to three miles wide. And just like Rowlett sighting, the object Malcolm saw disappeared within seconds. And I'm sure you see cylinders uh, under the water often in torpedoes and submarines. What made these cylinders so different from everything else? Uh, they were completely different. The cylinders that I would have been familiar with would have been nuclear submarines and the weapons they fired. This was neither. Dave Malcolm was an Autech employee and an expert in conventional underwater craft. So when he sees something that he can't identify under the water, it speaks volumes as to how odd this really was. However, I still don't think this was an extraterrestrial craft. Or did it physically break the surface? Never broke the surface. Did you see any turbulence around it, splashes? Dead cop. Was that rise and fall something that you typically see in something like a submarine? Sub would have a tendency to, to come up on a, on a more gradual uh, incline. Did we have anything back then, to your knowledge, that could have moved that quickly underwater? 
To my knowledge, at that time, we didn't have anything that could move like that. It was something in the water that, in my opinion, at that time, shouldn't have been in the water. If Autech was testing something out there near, near your vessel, wouldn't they notify crews and other ships out there that they were doing some testing? Not necessarily. Uh, a lot had to do with the need to know. So if, if you didn't have a specific need to know to accomplish your job function, you weren't told about it. Did you feel that was something you were not supposed to see? Absolutely. Since Autech appears to be more accessible than Area 51, and since, according to their website, they offer public tours, let's drive right up to the front gates of Autech and see if we can get in. Well, gentlemen, we're here. This is Autech, wow. eh? This is really it. We have called them, we've emailed them, we've written them. We've asked for the public information officer, director of public affairs, we've contacted the Navy, we've even tried to contact the base commander. And you know what their response was? Nothing. Nobody's gonna ask about the super weapons that are gonna defeat anybody in the Persian Gulf. What I'd like to do is just walk right up to the gate and say, hey, where's the UFO? Hi, we're here. Show us the ET. Are we trying to get us busted here? There's a helicopter, guys. You can tell he's tilting this way. We're slowing down. This is actually a little creepy. I don't think we're really welcome here, guys. Yeah, he's checking us out. We made it to the front gates of Autec. A helicopter flies over. A police car pulls up. Maybe a coincidence, maybe not. So obviously we really can't go much beyond this point. Those signs are very specific. Nobody allowed on the base for any reason whatsoever. Prudence might be the better part of valor. And we should probably pack up and leave. Okay. We've seen the same from the land side. Now let's see it from the water side. I'm Mike Hornby, and there's definitely strange things going on above the water and below the water at Autech. Mike Hornby is a dive master with 13 years of experience diving the waters around Autech. He's going to take us to the ocean side of Autech and take me diving to find what's down there. Can you tell us some experiences you've had in these waters? I have uh, noted on numerous occasions, a weird presence of lights that do not behave in what I would call a consistent pattern. Some of the speed of which I've seen these move has uh, maybe stop and pause about what it may be. Not only has Mike Hornby seen UFOs and USOs, he's seen something strange connected to Autech. On this particular site, I had to abandon using an electronic uh, compass because every time I went into the water around the site, I found that I was getting inconsistent readings. Oftentimes, it would cut in and cut out. When I got out of the water, I found that it worked properly. First, Kurt Rowlett mentions a malfunctioning compass during his UFO sighting. And then Mike Hornby tells us that his compass goes haywire whenever he's diving near Autech. We are, after all, on the edge of the Bermuda Triangle where compass malfunctions happen all the time. Is this explainable in any way? There is presence of, of cables that are in the water. Are these power cables that you're talking about, or are these like steel cables? These are, these are uh, sheathed steel-wrapped cables. They extend from the beginning of the dive site, from the shallow waters coming from Autech, and continue out. Do we have any theories on, on what's on the other end of these cables? Or what have, these cables are used for? You cannot tell, at least I cannot tell by looking at them, what their purpose is. Yeah, there's a lot of different theories as to what these cables can be. I mean, maybe they're used for sonar testing. 
Perhaps they're communication cables. Maybe there's some kind of craft tethered to the end of them. We need to trace the path of these cables and find out where they're coming from. And that's why Mike is trying to get us as close to Autech as possible. So how close to Autech will we actually be getting? Most as I get you is right along the breakwater. At what point did they get nervous? As soon as you enter through this gate. Right here. Yes. yes. They have somebody stationed right down at the wharf. The minute somebody comes in there that's not authorized, the information goes out. So what's that sign say? Restricted area, keep out, authorized personnel only. It's a lot like what we read at Area 51. Exactly like Area 51. Now what about flying over Autech? Can you fly over it? Well, it's an MOA, so you're not supposed to. And certainly when they have their, their op operations in effect, uh, you don't want to be doing that because they're firing missiles off. Sure. An MOA is an acronym for a military operations area, indicating a restricted airspace exclusively for military aircraft. Just like Area 51, you can't get there by plane, you can't get there by land, and right now we're as close as we can get to Autech by water. We follow the cables all the way from Autech, and it's starting to get deep. I have to wonder what will be at the end of the line. We're over something, okay, Mike, right stop. there. We're over something. Okay, drop it right there. We have three guys who have seen strange objects in the waters near Autech. This cable may have something to do with what's going on around here. This is where we're going to descend into the water. We'll likely encounter sharks as we're descending. And then once we get in down at the bottom, we're going to be swimming towards a big coral mound. We're going over the side of the coral mound, and we will, in fact, be picking up the cables. So the plan is we'll go down to about 120 feet and then out about 300 feet to the actual tongue of the ocean. Visibility is perfect. The seas are calm. And with our full tanks, we should be able to last about an hour underwater. We found the cable. It was thinner than I thought it was going to be. But it really is odd seeing a cable coming from Autech and heading out into the open sea. According to Mike's story, his compass went haywire somewhere around here. Thankfully, our compasses and our dive computers are working fine. So we get out to the edge of the tongue of the ocean, and we see that the cable disappears into the abyss. We're already at 120 feet, and there's no way we can see the bottom. What'd you say? Well, we went to the very edge. It's like flying over the Grand Canyon, except wow. you can't see the bottom. We follow the cables all the way to the very edge. And you just have to wonder where they go. The cable runs all the way from, from there, from Autech, all the way to the tongue of the ocean. So it's thousands of thousands of feet, depending on how deep that cable goes. Right, right, and who knows how long the cable runs along the ocean floor. So. Exactly. It could be a massive undertaking. Yeah. Autec is built on the tongue of the ocean, which is 6,000 feet deep, one of the deepest spots in the world. A suitable place for something to hide or for something secret to be tested. Even satellites can't spot what's down there. Well, this cable adds to the mystery of Autec just a little bit, I think. Uh, yeah, you said it. What's interesting about the cable we found is that it doesn't look to be an underwater power cable. They're usually upwards of eight inches in diameter. This cable is more likely some form of a communications cable, which is closer to one and a half inches in diameter. But what's strange is why is it going into a 6,000 foot deep gorge? We physically tried to get him to Autech, but it's impossible. So we found someone who has another way in. 
I've remote viewed for every major intelligence agency in America. I did see some USOs that were operating within the vicinity of Autec. Joseph McMonagle is a psychic spy employed by the U.S. military for the past 30 years. He did remote viewing for the military during the Vietnam War and used his skills to predict the development of enemy weaponry during the Cold War. He's won the Army's very prestigious Legion of Merit Award. Some of the things that I, I remote viewed about Autech were somewhat different. Definitely not some technology that I'm aware of that we have. Remote viewing is a psychic ability. For example, a remote viewer standing in Washington, D.C. can view a top secret military installation in Russia and gather information about what's happening there. In the 1970s, the U.S. military started a top secret remote viewing program called Stargate, where they recruited actual psychics to remote view enemy territory and Joseph McMonagall was the first psychic to be recruited. Can you give us any details, anything specific about what you saw? This, these particular objects that I've seen, they're uh, constructed of some metallic form. They have pulsing lights on them. Uh, they're making erratic moves very quickly in the water. Uh, the, the kinds of things that we just don't have the capacity to build. He sees strange objects, anomalous objects, out there hovering in the water, waiting, perhaps watching. These are not ours. These are probably not human. When you remote viewed these, were you able to perceive any entities inside these craft? I've seen an entity twice. Do you detect something mechanical in these figures? Uh, no, definitely it's alive. Could you describe it? I can give you a description of a three-fingered hand that's uh, somewhat wrinkled. Uh, I've seen the what I call skin suits or the environmental suits that I think they wear over their normal body. McMonagall's telling us that the beings he remote viewed had three fingers. This corresponds to what eyewitnesses told us a couple of months ago when they encountered extraterrestrials. So now you have to ask, are there aliens at Valencia? The actual USOs that I perceived that were adjacent to or very close to Autec contained possible entities that were not human. I'm just curious, what about the Autech base itself? Is there anything you can tell us about what you reviewed at Autech? Maybe what, what they're actually doing there? I do know what's going on there, but much of it is classified, so I would never disclose it. Is there anything happening with respect to extraterrestrials at Autech? I'd say I can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we need to find someone who can break it all down for us. Who's doing what and why? How are you, Max? Maximilien de Lafayette is a French ufologist who's written numerous encyclopedias about UFOs, extraterrestrials, and time travel. You said you know the secret from your sources of what Autech is and what is going on at Autech. Government is saying that they conduct exotic, aquatic, sophisticated weapon. It's much more than that. It's a nest for contact with uh, alien. Between the 17th and the 22nd of September 1958, mm -hmm. during the administration of President, President Eisenhower. Eisenhower, they had a meeting. When you say they had a meeting, who was they? They were extraterrestrial. They are from outer space, from different dimensions. According to Maximilian, back in 1958, U.S. government officials had a secret meeting with extraterrestrials, and the very next year, the order to build Autec was given. The timing of both events strikes me as more than coincidental. They told them, we, the alien, we are going to give you some, some remarkable secrets in exchange. Don't interfere with us when we appear in your skies. If we have a free access to your world, you will have access to very advanced technology. 
Maximilian is telling us some pretty unbelievable things, but I'm willing to bet that there's not a single scientist in the world that will go on record and back him up. I need to know what your sources are for this information. Uh, so I give you my, my sources. Uh, probably this is be the last time you'll see me, or anybody else will see me. OTEC, it's a laboratory of extremely exotic, avant-garde, multi-dimensional, multi-parallel universe technology. The US military working on, and perhaps working with, alien technology. Where have we heard this before? Area 51. Is Autex something like a portal where there are yeah. doorways into other dimensions? Yes. It's an entrance and exit to multiple universes. A gateway. A gateway. Well, there is a theory about this, about Autex, the energy and the alien and the program. They built their Autex on the top of Atlantis. As you know, the shape of, of Earth shifted many, many times. Atlantis is dispersed in so many places in the world. Wait, wait, wait. So the theory then is that somehow Atlantis was part of a unicontinent, which then separated when the tectonic plate shifted. Correct. This part of what Maximilian says is based in science. There was a single continent millions of years ago, Pangaea. Everything else? You have to keep an open mind and just evaluate the proof. Any small piece of Atlantis, whatever it is, can produce certain electromagnetic, they call it hydroplasma, that can suck up many things and produce energy. Part of Atlantis is there. Who lived in Atlantis? They were extraterrestrial. I mean, isn't it a bit much? Aren't we like, are we reaching? Are we trying to like roll every possible theory into one giant UFO burrito? The only thing it has to do with Autech is location. It's happening all in the same area. Is there some ulterior thing going on here that has to do with extraterrestrials and Autech and the Navy? I can't say that. Right now I'm just seeing coincidences. And then to top all these coincidences or this location business off, there's the uh, likelihood of some kind of interdimensional portal here. We've got to talk to somebody else who maybe knows more and can help us link ETs, USOs, and Autech. I'm Bruce Gernon, a pilot, and I have traveled through time. On December 4th, 1970, pilot Bruce Gernon claims to have flown into the future. He had more than 600 hours of flight time under his belt when it happened. He chronicled the entire phenomenon in his book called The Fog. It all began right here at, at this airport on uh, December 4th, 1970. And we took off and we were heading direct for Bimini. I noticed uh, right in front of my flight path, there was this uh, strange looking cloud. It was a lenticular cloud, but it was too low to be a lenticular. They usually form at 20,000, and, and this was only about 500 feet above the, the water, maybe a couple miles offshore. Mm -hmm. And it looked harmless. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and climbed right up over it. Lenticular clouds are stationary lens-shaped clouds that form at high altitudes. When they're densely packed and symmetrical, they can look a lot like flying saucers. I'm going 110 miles an hour climbing, and I looked around and I noticed this small lenticular cloud had spread out at an amazing rate. And it was like on either side of me as far as I could see, and, but it was also building up. I was at almost 11,500 feet, and then I, I broke free. I look in front of me, and now here's the same type of cloud, on, and it's built up to way over 50,000 feet. Then the tops met, and it formed this huge tunnel. And it was at 10,000 feet to the center of it, and it was like over 10 miles long. I went ahead and penetrated into it, 
and it was full of electricity. And what makes you think the clouds were full of electricity? Well, there were these flashes that were going on there, and they became stronger and stronger the deeper I went. And that's when I started traveling forward through time. When I was about 100 miles from Miami, I entered what I call a time tunnel vortex. And I started going forward through time. I had decided to go ahead and penetrate into this and try to get through it before it closed. And it should have taken me three minutes at least to reach the other end of the tunnel, but it only took about 20 seconds. And when I got there, it had shrunk to only about 30 feet because the wingtips scraped the edges of it. And then I looked at the tunnel and I watched it collapse. My three navigational instruments were all malfunctioning and even the magnetic compass was slowly rotating counterclockwise. And, but my radios were still working. So mm -hmm. I contacted Miami Radio and I told them I was about 90 miles east of Miami. And then he comes back on the radio and he's yelling really loud. He says, I've got an airplane directly over Miami Beach. When I landed back at Palm Beach International, I discovered that the flight took 30 minutes less than I had ever made that flight before. And I had made that flight at least a dozen times before. Do you have any evidence to support this claim of time traveling? Yes, I discovered that when I arrived, I had 10 gallons of extra fuel. Isn't there uh, any other explanation for this? I mean, isn't it possible that, the, that you went through some kind of huge storm and maybe some kind of tailwind pushed you closer to Miami, saving you the fuel and, and bringing you to Miami uh, quicker than you expected? I was 100 miles away from Miami. Mm -hmm. So to go to Miami in three minutes, I'd need to, uh, the wind would have to be close to 2,000 miles an hour. Wow, I see. Based on the information that Bruce gave us, a normal flight from Andros Island to West Palm Beach takes about 75 minutes to travel the 210 miles. His entire trip uses 38 gallons of fuel. Gernon actually flew 250 miles in 47 minutes and still had 10 gallons of fuel left when he arrived. This means that the A36 plane that he was piloting would have had to travel at 319 miles per hour to make this trip in 47 minutes. But that would have been impossible because Bruce's plane had a top speed of 234 miles per hour. Based on these numbers, Bruce's plane would have just been ripped apart by the stress. Do you think this was a result of an Autech experiment or just some natural thing that occurs around the Bermuda Triangle? It could be a combination of both. Autech could be experimenting with something that's a natural phenomenon. The Bermuda Triangle has a long history of craft mysteriously vanishing. December 1945, Flight 19 disappears over the Bermuda Triangle while on a training mission. June 1950, the 300-foot cargo ship, the Sandra, is never heard from again after sailing into the Bermuda Triangle. May 1968, the U.S. Navy submarine Scorpion goes missing and she never reaches port in Norfolk, Virginia. Maybe it's not a natural phenomenon after all. What if a lot of these reported events can be linked to Autech? We're meeting with physicist Dr. James Webb, professor at Florida International University. He's going to talk to us about the possibilities of time travel. General relativity has opened up a whole can of sort of worms, uh, the ability to have wormholes to, to connect other places. Dr. James Webb has been lecturing all over the country, traveling from university to university, explaining the physics of time travel, black holes, and wormholes. People have been, you know, interested in black holes uh, for a long time and explaining things in outer space. And there are certain characteristics. As a star collapses, all of its mass and its gravity remain. These forces are so strong that, that not even light can escape. Normal black hole physics does not allow anything to go in there without getting tightly ripped apart and destroyed. However, uh, people playing around with the mathematics have uh, introduced uh, electric and magnetic fields, have introduced rotation, at least mathematically, you can actually maybe survive the trip and go through 
These tunnels, uh, these wormholes as they came to be called, can, can either connect in our universe or in other universes. Here we have a bona fide university physicist telling us that mathematically, time travel is possible. So perhaps pilot Bruce Gernon's story is in fact a reality. Uh, if we want to form a black hole, we have to take some mass and collapse it down. And we can actually collapse this down and punch a hole into the fabric of space-time. This would lead to some other dimension. And so this would be the center of the black hole. How does that turn into a wormhole? Well, if you have another one on the other side that meets up with it, then you have it leading to another piece of space-time underneath. You could take the trip and go around the long way, or if you could survive the trip, you could duck down through, pop out instantaneously down here. You would travel this entire distance without ever going through space-time at all. Here's what we know. The possibility of time travel exists. And if what Max says is true, that Atlantis had some alien power source, then we need to find proof of this ancient civilization in the waters near Autec. Hi, Greg. Hi, Laura. How are you? Bill, how are you doing? Good to meet uh, you. Thanks for seeing right. us today. Hey. Dr. Greg Little and his wife, Laura, part of an organization called A.R.E., the Association for Research and Enlightenment. So what are you guys doing here in the Bahamas? I hear you've made 200 dives. What are you looking for? Atlantis. Ah. The A.R.E. believes the Bahamas were a part of, of Atlantis, according to Edgar Casey, and this was one of the, the main areas of Casey's Atlantis. Edgar Casey was one of the most famous psychics that ever lived. He predicted that one day Atlantis would be found near the Bahamas. What would you need to find yourself to convince you that Atlantis was based in the Bahamas? Well, something we could carbon date. All we could hope for would probably be some stone foundations. So have you found anything interesting, any, any evidence of that? We were here in 2003 and a, a dive operator came to talk to us one night and when he found out we were looking at at anomalies like the Bimini Road, which he was familiar with, he uh, told us that there was another similar formation right out here in Nicholstown. And so we uh, went out and Greg snorkeled and discovered what looked to him to be large megalithic blocks. I'm a diver, I'd love to join you and, and have a Do look it. and see what, what we can see down there. We're here in Nicholstown on the northern part of Andros Island, about 30 miles from Autec. Back in 2003, Dr. Greg Little and his wife, Laura, went diving here looking for the ruins of Atlantis. And what they found could be the remnants of an ancient civilization. So we'll be diving at about a depth of 20 feet. And visibility will be about 20 to 30 feet because the water's a little cloudy. And we've got full tanks of air, and we'll be diving about 300 feet off the shore of Nicholstown. We're about to capture this underwater structure on high definition for the first time. Well, we found something. It's some kind of stone formation. The first thing I notice are these right angles that make it look like these stones are carved. These stones are huge and appear to be layered one on top of the other to form some kind of platform or structure. And last, the structure seems to go off hundreds of feet into the distance. Whatever it is, it definitely looks like it was intentionally built. So, to really get a better understanding of what you've got here, it's going to take a lot more work. Yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of work, and really you have to look at it when it's uncovered. And we saw it when it was pretty much totally uncovered, right at, and it, it was actually a hurricane that uncovered it.
So Greg and Pat, show us what you saw down there. All right, Dr. Little and I entered the water and he led me to uh, what looked to be kind of a structured surface slightly raised above the ocean floor. It's noticeably different. It's, uh, it's kind of smooth, uh, it's segmented, you know, and, and, it, and it, there seems to be a, a direction to it. Like it's, it's not just in one area, but it actually goes off into the distance. Did you see right angles and straight cuts? But yeah, absolutely we did. And then you could look off into the distance and you could still see more of these, these straight lines. So did so, you get the impression that it was man-made or natural? Well, certainly it's enigmatic. You know, if I was diving this spot alone and I, I didn't know what it was, I would think it was, it was really weird. Can we discount the possibility that it is just some unusual type of reef? It's not a reef by definition. This is beach rock. And we know that because we were able to carbon date it. They pulled the shell out of the beach rock. It's 4,000 BC. Dr. Little actually had the stone structure carbon dated. And it turns out it's 6,000 years old. And it points to the existence of a civilization that isn't documented in human history. What do you think that is? I think it's a harbor that was in use around 3,000 BC or so, maybe 4,000 BC. It's sitting on a natural high spot where they brought in beach rock and laid beach rock down to create an enclosed harbor area. Is it a coincidence that what looks like a harbor built by intelligent design well before any documented civilization was here in such close proximity, not only to the reported home of Atlantis, but also to an alleged time portal? All this revolving around a secret base at Artec. Yes, there are some very unusual things going on around Autech, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any kind of extraterrestrial involvement. I mean, at this point, all we have to go on is eyewitness testimony of strange lights in the sky and under the water. That's it. There's no proof that the government is working with aliens at Autech. All we have is testimony by some very credible witnesses, but there are no videos, no photos, and no tangible evidence. What about the testimony of decorated military remote viewer Joe McMonagle? I mean, I don't think we can ignore this at all. Every single major government agency come to this guy for information, and the information he is giving us is that there are USOs, UFOs, he's even getting images of aliens piloting these craft. The picture we put together is that Autech is much more than a military base. We have former Autech employees telling us about this strange, unexplained craft that they saw. Extraterrestrial involvement seems like a real possibility here. No matter how you slice it, any which way you go, the Navy chose to put that test center in that place, remote, guarded. Nobody can get there. Who else do we know that did that? The Air Force, putting it their own test center at Area 51 in Nevada. Air Force Area 51, or Tech is the Navy's Area 51. There are six billion people in the world, and the possibility of seeing a UFO in the sky is pretty likely when you think about it. But underwater, the possibilities of seeing a USO by comparison are infinitesimal. We know more about the surface of the moon and even Mars than we do about our own oceans. I think our investigation has conclusively shown that what's going on at Area 51 in Nevada is going on here. The U.S. military is quite possibly working with aliens. Autech really is the underwater Area 51. Ever since the detonation of the first atomic bomb, the numbers of UFO sightings have increased dramatically. The question is, have our threats to ETs increased as well? I actually said to my husband, they just bombed New York. Many UFOs are spotted near government labs that are home to top secret energy research. It's not really a question of, do you think they will? They have done that several times. There are even reports of a possible cover-up of UFOs being shot down over national laboratories at Brookhaven and Lawrence Livermore. We had a source that had seen lasers actually coming out of Livermore. We've uncovered shocking video. Okay, here we go. That supposedly shows a piece of a smoldering UFO. We will have the first evidence of a UFO crash in American history. Have we fired the first shot 
You want to see these two guys, one's pulling out a body bag. And are we under surveillance by alien craft? If they're balloons, if they're drones, if they're some kind of experimental things, fine. I just need to know what they are. This is case number 92202, UFO surveillance. We have gotten some pretty incredible footage taken by a person who was filming across Long Island Sound from the Connecticut South Shore, and he caught some really strange lights over Long Island. It reminds me of the 1992 alleged crash over South Haven Park, where supposedly Brookhaven National Laboratories was involved. The 1992 crash of a UFO in a wooded area on Long Island occurred just five miles south of Brookhaven National Laboratories. That's significant because high-tech energy facilities have long been suspected of attracting alien interest. Well, Brookhaven National Lab, I mean, that's a state-of-the-art scientific research facility. Look what's happening over at Brookhaven National Labs in terms of, of atomic colliders. And they created the first peacetime nuclear reactor. There are 21 national laboratories in the U.S., and of these, the leaders in energy research are arguably Lawrence Livermore and Brookhaven. The leading innovations in particle beams, lasers, fusion, and directed energy are more than likely going to come from one of these two facilities. When we set off the bomb, we almost sounded an alarm. Big, huge nuclear explosions. Some other planet out there was listening, and they heard our signals. Think about all the UFO activity that occurred after the bombs were dropped in World War II. Now they're here to stay, and they're checking us out to make sure we don't do it again. Ever since we began nuclear research in the 1940s, it seems UFOs have followed. From Hanford in Washington State, to White Sands in New Mexico, to the test site in Nevada, it's no coincidence that breakthroughs in high-tech weapons seem to be accompanied by UFO sightings. Just what are UFOs doing over some of these top research facilities? I think it's time we got proactive and try to surveil them instead of waiting for them to surveil us. Brookhaven National Laboratory has been a worldwide pioneer in energy research for over 60 years. It was the first facility to build a peacetime nuclear reactor, and for years it actively promoted the use of atomic energy. Six Nobel Prizes have come from work at Brookhaven. One of the world's largest particle accelerators was built there. The work being done here is far ahead of what most understand about science. So if extraterrestrial civilizations were interested in how we would challenge or threaten distant galaxies, they would hypothetically want to set up surveillance over Brookhaven. I'm not a ufologist, I'm not an aviation buff. I'm just someone who's paying attention to objects that are appearing in the night sky over Long Island Sound that no one else seems to be interested in. Mark, how are you doing? Well, Brad, good. nice to meet you. After seeing strange lights in the sky over Long Island Sound, Mark has made a dedicated practice of videotaping them regularly. He backs up all his work by plotting his location on maps recording compass headings, and taking notes so that he can figure out what these lights are. Originally, they were appearing in the Smithtown Bay area, kind of like over Sunken Meadows State Park. They would seem to be stationary for long periods of time, sometimes changing position. They would stay almost motionless for hours at a time. These things don't stroke. They're just steady lights. They almost look like little suns. They're so consistently lit. It looks like a dance when they start to move. There's a relay. They kind of change places. So what do you consider your best footage so far? Over the Norwalk Islands, there were some that were hovering so low above the horizon. They were kind of like moving sideways from behind the island.
Have you ever gotten a good enough view of these lights to make out a shape? Through binoculars, I could see that it looked like a lozenge-shaped craft with two headlights in it. The lights that Mark is describing match up with the craft in the surveillance operation. They travel in a set pattern, they hover in place, and they don't seem in a hurry to leave. We need to get more information on these flying objects to see if they're keeping vigil near Brookhaven National Laboratories. Why do you go out so much to see the lights? If they're balloons, if they're drones, if they're some kind of experimental things, fine. Whatever they are, I just need to know what they are. Like Mark, I want to discover what these lights are. Uh, they might not flash or strobe like a traditional airplane, but there are so many airports over Long Island, I want to see if there's a correlation. Terrace Massan is a video analyst who's an expert at finding the truth about what's on tape. Most UFO footage that he analyzes is brief and it's rushed, but Mark's video is different. There are hours of footage, and it's meticulously supported with data. He's been very diligent about recording his shooting location, and he keeps very good notes. I would call him a very reliable witness. We actually pick up a very large number of these lights. What's consistent through all of the footage is that their motion is almost stationary. It's very, very slow. What was a little freaky was when you speed these things up at, at uh, many multiple times uh, uh, playback speed, they dance and fly all around in, in uh, repeated patterns, follow each other. Very wild behavior. The first thing that I always do when I look at this footage is uh, try to establish um, sight lines. Where's the shooter? Where's the angle of, of shooting? What's the aspect ratio? Um, what's the coverage? And I actually have a map here I can show that plots this out. You can see up here on the southern Connecticut shore, six different locations that I was able to isolate and then correspond his shooting directions. The next thing I did was plot out the location of all the local airports. Six out of the seven sight lines, basically bullseye are Republic, JFK, and LaGuardia airports. You can see the pattern actually corresponds to figure eight, kind of corkscrew, very consistent with lineup coming into an airport. Now, is every video taken line of sight to airport just like this? No. So this is the remaining footage. So we're watching it, same camera settings, same effects, blown out lights, hanging there in air. Now watch this. Wow. Just this, <laughs> it's very odd. You can see how this thing moves so fast it blurs into a horizontal line mm -hmm. and it dips down, comes to a stop, dips down below the tree line, and there's actually two more in view at the same time following the same pattern. This one remaining piece of footage that doesn't correspond to flight characteristics of commercial aircraft. Look at this one sight line yeah. that kind of goes off on its own. Mm -hmm. So it's just shooting out. He's, he's over here in the Norwalk area, right. shooting along the coast. There aren't any airports. We can't identify them with any of the characteristics we've used to dismiss all the other footage. Uh, so yeah, they, uh, yeah, they are left unidentified. Mark's video shows us this, craft that could appear to be about 25 miles from Brookhaven National Laboratory, flying in repeated patterns that could suggest a set surveillance routine. Given Brookhaven's long history as a leader in breakthrough energy research, and perhaps an equally long history of UFO surveillance, you'd expect some sort of reported incidents and encounters, and we have one a widely reported crash near Brookhaven National Laboratory in November 1992. I'm Denise Kozowski. On the evening of November 24, 1992, 
we saw a mysterious light light up the entire sky. It was uh, about seven o'clock at night, and being November, it was full dark. And all of a sudden, it was lighter out than it is right now. After that, we noticed the lights in the surrounding area, the surrounding homes were out. There were some gentlemen standing out front, and they seemed to be pointing in the direction of South Haven Park. How long did the sky stay light? It was uh, 10 seconds, maybe, a flash. Enough for you to go, what's going on? I actually said to my husband, they just bombed New York. Ever since that evening, we've heard a lot of stories about what might have happened in South Haven Park and things that had happened around that area. We're meeting with Denise Kosowski, an eyewitness who saw a tremendous flash across the sky on November 24th, 1992. It was the same night that a UFO reportedly crashed in South Haven County Park, just five miles from Brookhaven National Laboratories. I know we lost our lights, and I know the next few blocks over lost their lights. But when they contact the utility company, there's no record of any problems with the electric that night in this area. But you personally experienced the power outage. Yes. So the utility, as far as you were concerned, is not telling the truth. Exactly. Through the whole thing, it was that there was something that was being kept from the public. Talking to Denise was great because she really cemented it all together for me. Something strange did happen in the park. Huge lights in the sky, the power went off in the neighborhood. It's on the same night that this crash was reported. So finally we have some real information that we can use that something very strange did happen that night and there was an incident in the park. Whoever wants to give you an explanation can give you 10 different explanations, mm -hmm. but you can't explain that light. According to Denise and other witnesses, something emitted a huge flash in the sky in 1992. Some think that it might have been a UFO, possibly doing surveillance on Brookhaven National Laboratory, that was shot down and rained debris over South Haven County Park. Although the park was reportedly locked down afterward, there still may be some trace evidence that remains. So this is where it happened? This, this whole area is where it happened. This is more of a debris field rather than a crash. Steve Ivoroni and Tony West are veteran UFO investigators on Long Island. Along with other members of LUFON, they investigated the crash in 1992. If anyone can shed light on this case, it's Steve and Tony. We have eyewitnesses that say something that was falling out of the sky, they said it had a cylindrical shape, it was rotating and turning from blue to white to green. As it came over the park, it made a right angle turn, and it just fell apart all over this place. So here's what we've got so far. Mark's footage of a craft possibly doing surveillance and coming in from the southeast. And in that same direction, we have witness Denise Kozowski describing a bright, sustained flash in the sky in November 1992. And now we have additional witness reports from that night about a craft that spun out of control before exploding and raining debris all over the park. Could this UFO be the same type of craft that Mark caught on tape? Who would normally respond to some kind of accident or, or crash out here? The, the Hageman Fire Department did respond. They were the first people on the scene to put out the fire. The Suffolk County Police came on and started closing the park down. They let Brookhaven National Lab inside the park. They were the only ones allowed inside the park, and all the other fire departments were outside the perimeter of the park. Get in. Why couldn't they get in? Suffolk County Police turned them away. 40 minutes approximately after that, these guys in black jumpsuits came over to the Suffolk County Police, told them to leave the area, and they left immediately. This is a huge twist in the story of what happened at South Haven Park that night. There's no reason a fire crew from Brookhaven National Laboratories should have had special access to the crash that night, but witnesses said they did. The witnesses described this debris was carried out on a flatbed. Trucks look like military trucks with mm -hmm. a military kind of canvas mm -hmm. wrapped around it. So with such a large debris field, how long would you estimate it would take to clean up the wreckage? Well, they did it in two days. Towards the end of the second day, they had to actually widen the roads to get the flatbeds in and to get the flatbeds out. So you mean they had construction crews actually widening the roads? We only know that from when we came back and we found that the roads were widened. 
this case is over 16 years old, and it would be nice to have more first-hand witness accounts. What we have is a lot of reports about road closures, strange behavior of authorities in charge, and a utility company's denial of a power outage. I mean, is this a well-executed conspiracy or just a non-event? I think we have to keep digging. There was a fireman who actually was videotaping all of this activity. About a week, week and a half later, it was anonymously left in our mailbox. He doesn't want us to know who he is, but he feels that you should, we should know about this. Okay, Steve, show us the video. Follow me. Who's got the DVD? Steve? Right here. Walk us through it, Steve. Okay, here we go. You see the big chunk of debris yeah. right over there on fire? Mm -hmm. And you see how the cameraman is zooming in on it? In about a second, you're gonna see these two guys, one's pulling out a body bag, and they're stacking something up against the tray. It's very intriguing. There are men doing some kind of activity involving mylar blankets, which uh, would be used to cover bodies. Uh, if this was a crash, you know, hypothetically, this is what these men could be covering up. If this tape is real, we will have the first live recorded evidence of a UFO crash in American history. The videotape of the supposed UFO crash response was anonymously dropped in the mailbox belonging to UFO investigators. And we don't know how many generations removed from the original it is. And without more information, we just can't tell if this is a hoax or not. So to find the truth, we need to meet with the first responders in the area to find out their take about what happened. November 1992, members of the department did respond up uh, to what was a report of smoke in the area, a uh, potential fire. So now Chief of South Country Ambulance Company, Greg Maglino Jr., was on duty that night, November 24th, 1992. If there were an accident or a crash in South Haven County Park, his ambulance would have rolled on it. So I was in one of my marked vehicles, so I started heading that way. It was determined by either the Park Police or the Suffolk County Police Department, who have jurisdiction over there, that it was just simply some campers that were there later in the year. So someone announced over the radio that there was no need for any other units to show up. We weren't specifically told to go away. Once we heard that it was the campgrounds, we uh, released ourselves. I mean, this is not a scenic national park or anything. It's a county park in the suburbs of Long Island on a weeknight in November with nighttime temperatures in the 30s. Not exactly the time or place to attract a lot of campers. Now, if there had been some kind of a hazmat incident or an incident involving uh, nuclear materials, uh, who would roll on that? In 1992, that would either be the Suffolk County Emergency Services Unit back then, uh, Brookhaven National Lab. Why would Brookhaven be a facility that would respond to any kind of nuclear accident and be in charge of the decontamination? Brookhaven National Lab has a near, uh, or had a small reactor that they've used for many years for testing, uh, and their firefighters and fire department are explicitly trained in responding to radiological emergencies. We need to go to ground zero in this case, and that's Brookhaven National Laboratories itself. We've gained special access to the laboratory grounds to meet with one of Brookhaven's leading scientists. Brookhaven is a national laboratory run by the U.S. Department of Energy for peacetime research and scientific research. Todd Sadagata is an accelerator physicist and the leader of the Physics Accelerator Operations Analyst Group at the Collider Accelerator Department in Brookhaven. We are investigating a lot of UFO activity that took place right here on the edge of Long Island. Our hypothesis that somehow UFOs are kind of drawn to our use of uh, nuclear power to kind of keep an eye on us. And we're wondering what your take might be on that. Uh, I've worked at Brookhaven for a long time and I have never seen anything like that. Uh, but then again, I'm a scientist and, and what I value is data. Uh, we have uh, several particle accelerators here on site. The newest is the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. You're actually in our control room right now. 
What we're doing in this collider is studying particles that make up atomic nuclei and the forces between them to understand the underlying matter. Particle colliders work by accelerating atoms to near the speed of light and then smashing them together. These collisions release billions of subatomic particles that scientists can study, and in doing so, can unlock some of the mysteries of the universe. Well, does the energy that's released in the collider, might some aspect of that energy be detected from Earth orbit? Particles that come out of there, most of those particles decay away very rapidly. But there are particles they're produced that then travel off long distances. Our particle colliders might look a little brighter than the rest of the planet. So your experiments here are actually giving off some kind of a signature. If you can detect those sorts of things, uh, it very well could be. Brookhaven's particle accelerator produces so much energy and perhaps could release so many particles that the operation could be detected from outer space by anyone with especially sensitive detection equipment. So perhaps the operation could be a signal to ETs to come for a closer look. Did you hear anything about uh, an incident that occurred uh, five miles uh, from here uh, in, in 1992? Maybe a big fire or something like that? What you can do is you can talk to our fire captain. Uh, he was part of the response crew then. He was actually on site at the time and he has much more experience about it. Witnesses reported that Brookhaven National Laboratory was the only fire department allowed access to the park. We've got to talk to this fire crew to confirm or deny the accuracy of this report. There was nothing that happened, to be totally honest. Uh, the 24th, uh, I do have the logbook here. There was nothing unusual, no unusual calls, and the laboratory equipment, as far as Brookhaven National Laboratory, never left site that night for any reason. Chuck LaSalle is the current chief of the Brookhaven National Laboratory firefighting team. Now, he's been there for 33 years, so he'll know what happened back in November 1992. Now, it, there's no mention in the logbook about a crash or, or even just a fire in general. Um, does that mean there wasn't a fire in South Haven Park that night? Would it be in the logbook? I don't know that there was a fire in South Haven Park. I, again, could tell you, we did not participate or mutual aid in any shape, way, or form to South Haven Park that night. If you were involved in some sort of operation that uh, dealt with national security, would that be something that might be expunged from, from your logs or something that you would not be able to speak about? I would have to say yes, but I wouldn't lie to you and say, oh, well, this couldn't be kept a secret, except 17 years in a firehouse. If you know anything about a firehouse, we like to brag. And for, for this never to be released in 17 years, what a great secret. So if there were a fire at South Haven Park 16 years ago and we were to go in a scene, what would you recommend that we look for? 16 years, 17 years is going to cover a lot and you still could have the fact that there were other brush fires there over that period. So charred areas might not give away the fact that there was a crash there as such. Uh, maybe the tops of trees, but uh, as I said, 16, 17 years is a long time. Chief Lasala said the lab's firefighting crew never responded to a crash at South Haven County Park. So we have to go back to the scene to look for crash evidence ourselves. To do all this, we need a forensic archeologist. So we're bringing in an expert, Garth Baldwin. Well, I've been brought in today to take a look around at the landform, uh, the vegetation, any environmental indicators that might lead us to uh, a conclusion about the story that was told out here. There's supposed to be a road of some kind and things like that. So what we want to look for are unnatural modifications to the landform and the vegetation. So what do you think of this place? Well, coming in, um, all the vegetation along this, you know, roughly 25 feet strip is less than 17 years old. The trees are only maybe five to 10. And that's a funny sort of crushed, broken limb up there. See how it's mm -hmm. crushed and it's, yeah. it's splintered? There's a lot of broken stuff out here. If Garth is right, then there should still be signs of, of the fallen debris that would have collided with the tops of these oak trees. So we're looking for oak trees that might have fracturing in the branch structure, even after all this time. 
As for the road, Tony and Steve told us that the UFO debris removal crew had to fortify the dirt road for all the flatbed trucks moving in and out of the park. We're looking for signs of that road. And it's interesting that on either side of this strip of the forest, there are stands of oak trees that are from 18 to 40 feet tall. But in the middle of the strip, there are younger, smaller trees, only six feet tall. This bears a closer look. What would explain a clearing like this amidst the denseness of places That's, like that? Well, something definitely cleared out everything through here. And not a fire. I mean, that wouldn't explain it because there'd be stumps. There's nothing in here. It could be a road. And then it's, it's dark underneath there. You've got that gray sand. That's definitely a traveled surface. Top of these hills or something, there might mm -hmm. be a, a, a more natural surface. No, it's a lot softer. A lot softer. So there's your differential compaction right there. Garth has shown that the soil in the supposed location of the fortified dirt road is more compact and shows more signs of travel from soil samples taken nearby. There's some scarring at the top of that tree. Mm -hmm. So that tree is, uh, it was alive when it was broken off, it was sheared off, and it's growing back. Garth is telling me two things that are really interesting. One, he's looking at the tops of these trees and saying that the way some of these trees have been lopped off, topped off, is consistent with an object coming down in a debris field. So you like shrapnel coming down. It would hit some trees, it wouldn't hit others. Exactly. Um, we saw, you know, there's a couple of them that are splintered, you know, a couple of those branches that are splintered, that, that top was taken off and it's regrowing, it's scarred. And two, he looked at the compaction of the road up a piece and down here and said, you know what, that's not inconsistent with an army flatbed falling a piece of debris out, getting it back up this road in two days. There's no inconsistency there. It could have happened. Well, what did you think of uh, what we found out on Long Island? I have to say I was really impressed with Mars footage. I mean, there's, there's no way to really easily explain what he caught on video. That was some very strange footage, but does it tie into the crash and the sightings at South Haven? Fortunately, I don't think we can make a definitive connection to a UFO crash. What did you guys think of Brookhaven? I looked at the log myself, and it looks legit. And if they were going to cover it up, they did a hell of a good job. You have to factor in all the eyewitnesses that actually saw Brookhaven National Lab vehicles uh, going to the crash site. That's right. So, I mean, I don't know how you explain that. Look, guys, we're freezing out here. On the west coast, it's warmer, where there's another video of UFOs over Lawrence Livermore, a laboratory like BNL does energy research, unlike BNL, weapons research. Lasers. Lasers, high energy lasers. So let's see what UFO activities over Lawrence Livermore. I look forward to it. Let's right. go. After examining footage, witness reports, and trace evidence of UFO activity over Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, we're heading into Altamont Hills to search for alien surveillance in the skies over the premier weapons research lab in North America, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Okay, here's where I worked for 17 summers. I taught physics during the year at Nebraska mm -hmm. Omaha and came out here. I worked in D Division. I studied the physics of the effects of nuclear weapons. Not only was Jack Kasher a professor of physics at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, he spent 18 years working on powerful microwave lasers as a researcher at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Was the work that you were working on at the time, was that classified information? Yeah, it was very, very highly classified. I found as time went on, security became a lot tighter at the lab. What was the ratio to pure science research to Department of Defense weapons research? Most of the time when I was out here, it was about 50-50, where you'd have you know, astrophysics, geology, and so on. And that, that made up about half of it, and the rest of it was defense-oriented. Weapons research became a big priority. They did work on nuclear-powered X-ray lasers that were the foundation of the Star Wars Missile Defense Program. 
And if Livermore concentrated that much on weapons research, it's likely that they became a target for alien surveillance. There's the theory that once humanity started uh, developing nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, that extraterrestrials are observing facilities where this is taking place. They do. Over in uh, Russia, for example, uh, a 900-foot diameter saucer hovered over a Russian missile silo for four hours. Then you got Malmstrom, where the UFO was over the base. I mean, it's, it's not really a question of do you think they will? They have done that several times. Do you know of anything at Lawrence Livermore Labs that would give off some kind of signature that could be detected from space? They've done some, some fusion experiments and so on, and that, that might be attractive. Jack, I'm curious about the effectiveness of, of lasers as a weapon. It would certainly have to be powerful enough to knock a missile out, and so uh, I don't know how well defended a, a UFO would be, but uh, it would be worth a shot, I guess, if we felt it was some kind of a threat to us. So would aliens consider lasers a threat then? I think that uh, if what we're speculating about is true, certainly. If Brookhaven's particle beam research were somehow involved in bringing down a UFO, then Lawrence Livermore Labs, which makes no secret about its mission to preserve national security, would be even more inclined to have the weaponry to take out a UFO. We're going to meet with an investigator who might have information on such a case involving Livermore. Some sort of a streaking object had shot across the entire sky of the Bay Area, roughly. I mean, we had reports that it made a course correction off coast before coming inland, um, before breaking apart. Olav Phillips was one of the first investigators to report on the supposed UFO crash in August 1998 over Livermore, California. We had a source that had seen um, lasers actually coming out of Livermore. Late at night on August 6th, 1998, witnesses over the Bay Area report seeing a craft in the air making abrupt directional changes. That means it couldn't have been a meteorite. Just hours after the sighting, a very strange thing happens at a tire dump just seven miles away from Livermore's test area. Did anyone bother to come up here and investigate a possible crash site the next day or, or days after this was all reported? You know, everyone, including me, wanted to come out here. But unfortunately, because of, there was a tire fire associated with the area where it had crashed. So the whole area was completely toxified. How close is this tire fire to the alleged crash site? Uh, I believe it was less than a quarter of a mile. The tire dump burns for two entire years and is not cleaned up for five years. By that point, any possible traces of the reported UFO crash are long obliterated. It takes very little to burn grass. Right. However, it takes a lot to ignite, as you're calling it, a massive field of tires. That's something that, that has bothered me for the last 10 years. I mean, from an investigational point of view, it's a nightmare because everything is gone. It was a perfect cover. I don't know if it was intentionally started as a cover, but it definitely served as a cover. At both Brookhaven and Livermore National Laboratories, we have apparent signs of UFO crashes occurring in close proximity to places where high energy research has been performed. This could suggest that UFOs perceive these labs as posing a threat to them thus meriting surveillance operations. What's even more intriguing is how both crashes seem to be covered up. At South Haven Park, we heard how feds had arrived at the scene and erased any evidence of a UFO debris field. Now here at Livermore, we see how a suspicious tire fire might have obliterated any evidence of a UFO crash. Near Long Island, Mark's UFO footage was proof of UFO surveillance near Brookhaven. What we need now is video evidence of surveillance near Lawrence Livermore Labs. And we might have it. Hey Al, how's it going? Good, good. Al Murphy is one of the premier video analysts in all of California. In fact, Al worked at Lockheed Skunk Works 
on some classified projects, and he specializes in figuring out what's happening on a video, how movement can be determined. This video was shot by a gentleman named Pablo, who did not want to appear on camera. He told us he was 20 miles away from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. Well, the first thing I noticed is that it looks like it was shot with a night vision scope. You can see there's an object here very high up, very far away. It looks like it's moving very fast. It's a sequence of lights. Mm -hmm. The geometry of the lights is different, uh, and they kind of move with respect to each other. If uh, you look closely, you can see s stars behind the lights, so I, that would kind of indicate to me that it's a formation and not a single craft. Right, but a formation of what? A formation of something that we don't know what it is. Are helicopters an option? I don't think helicopters are an option. To be pulling maneuvers like this, flying in tight formation, again over over civilian airspace, it just it doesn't really uh, doesn't really work for me. After looking at this and, and after this discussion, would you say these lights are, are pretty unconventional? Well, I would say it's pretty unconventional to fly in close formation at night. Yes. We have to consider the possibility that we are looking at a UFO that is interested in what's going on over Lawrence Livermore Labs. I think it's really time to find out what has happened at Livermore and what's happening now. We are so excited about the possibility that UFOs are surveilling Lawrence Livermore Labs. We're going to use our Fleer truck, our very high-tech surveillance vehicle with all kinds of cameras and imaging devices to stay out here at night. Maybe we can discover our own UFO. Hi, guys. Come on in. This camera is sensitive uh, in a much further wavelength from the visible. We're meeting with Roy Momberg of the FLIR Corporation, one of the pioneering inventors of thermal imaging technology. We're going to spend the night on a sky watch with Roy to figure out just what is flying over Livermore. So we're not actually seeing lights. We're not seeing tail lights and, and headlights there. That's correct. The human eye can register only a minor portion of light in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, approximately in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. At best, night vision cameras like Pablo's double this range. But this FLIR camera, on the other hand, expands this range a thousandfold. If aliens and extraterrestrials are, are doing things that operate outside of our visual spectrum, as some people have hypothesized, how effective would this be? in our search for aerial vehicles over uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Anything that puts out a thermal signature, this camera is going to see. With the tool that I have here, I can spot an airplane as we're doing right here across the approach corridors 25, 30 miles away. If an alien craft were keeping watch over this lab and that craft generated the slightest thermal signature, Lawrence Livermore would, would have the technology to quickly detect it and it would most likely possess just the weapon to destroy that craft. You're gonna see scheduled airline traffic coming and going on the approach end into Oakland. So if we keep going this way, we should probably find the next guy that's out there. And there he is right there. That's just a blob of heat in the sky. How can you determine that that is an airplane? Well, if, if I could get at it close enough here now, and I'll zoom in a little bit. Look like it could be a cylinder, possibly a flying saucer. It could be, but you know, because I'm staring at the approach end, I'm guessing that it's an airplane going into Oakland. So if we're going to differentiate between a flying saucer, an extraterrestrial craft, and an airplane, it's going to be based on the flight pattern of the craft, the movement. That would be an indicator that I would use to, to come to a conclusion about what I was looking at. So even with this advanced thermal imaging system, we can see how some conventional aircraft might be mistaken for UFOs. Still, nothing we've seen here dispels our analysis that Mark's footage of craft near Brookhaven and Pablo's footage of weird formations near Livermore are unconventional. The craft in those videos could definitely be doing surveillance at those labs. Let's see here. Why is that doing that? Let's get a closer look on that, see if we can zoom in. 
That one's a go fast. Either that or he's closer, right? But that's an assumption. It could also be a very fast moving object in the distance, right? Could be. Could be way far away and really going real fast. In which case, it wouldn't be one of ours. What's going on with this craft is that it's moving suspiciously fast. Plus, its flight pattern and performance characteristics don't initially seem conventional. We could be onto something here. There's a target between us, and you know he'd have to be real close. That that kind of angular velocity there would have had to have been pretty close. Well, operating the joystick, being at the controls of the camera was like, uh, you know, playing the ultimate UFO hunting video game. I had full control of the camera. I just got the feeling if there was anything up there, uh, I was going to be able to see it using this system. We can take a closer look here. We can probably pick out, yeah, there we go. That uh, looks like it's got a tail. The, the structure has got a vertical tail to the back of it. I can't type that, but it looks to be small, corporate jet or a private aircraft. If they really are UFOs and they really are technologically advanced, they know our intentionality way before we execute a really good ET will know how to stay away and not leave a heat signature. Hence, we haven't seen anything. I'm not surprised, but I'm really excited over seeing this technology firsthand at this advanced stage. Statistically speaking, there are thousands of UFO sightings every year, and one of them is bound to match up with a strange fire or a flash in the sky and a power outage. Now are people just taking bits of information and concocting a fantastic story around these coincidences? Or is this really a cover-up? After looking at all the evidence, I'm not convinced that there's a widespread UFO surveillance over our most important energy laboratories. I mean, there are tens of thousands of UFO sightings every year in the US. And laboratories such as Livermore and Brookhaven are located near major population centers. So it's only natural that witnesses would think that they see UFOs over these labs. If people have been contacted by some government agency and sworn to secrecy, they're not going to tell us anything. You know, if records have been expunged, deleted, we're not going to find anything. We have to focus on eyewitness accounts, uh, people videotaping UFOs in some cases. We've received two sets of videotapes. Neither of our experts can offer explanations for these craft in the sky. When you match these videos with all the stories we've heard, it adds up for me. There's alien surveillance over our national labs. You've got two parallel situations. Two cases where mysterious craft crash. And it's not the crash, it's what happens afterwards that bothers me. Something tells me that behind it, there's a much, much larger conspiracy that's covering up alien surveillance. The details of the cover-ups at Brookhaven and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories can't be ignored. And neither can the possibility that these UFOs were brought down for reasons of national security. And the surveilling craft were keeping watch on these laboratories. And they got too close. End of story.